is our first, as we said, joint webinar, Northern Standard, Navigating Decarbonisation, MEPC 80, Impact on Shipping. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. It's been quite a busy week in the IMO. There's been quite a lot going on and depends on who you listen to. There's some schools of thought who are satisfied with the progress and the onward targets, but some aren't quite so happy. Anyway, we'll progress on. Throughout the presentation, we're going to take it in turn. So I'll be starting just to give a bit of an overview. Then I'll be passing on to Edwin, who's going to dig deeper on biofuels, IMO DCS and other life cycle analysis. And then Edwin will then pass on to Eva, who will then be looking at bunker delivery notes, followed by Helen, who's going to dig deeper into the contractual side and some of the ETS uh, questions that we've been asked. We've been asked a number of questions throughout the process, the registration process, so we've tried to incorporate answers into the presentation, but obviously there's a lot of questions to be asked, so some we may need to cover later and some questions were slightly off topic, but please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions at all. So let's get underway now and get started. So first of all, we'll hear a lot of talk about life cycle analysis and what this means throughout the next period. And I just thought for those of you that aren't familiar, we'll give a very brief description. Now, for those of you watching a recording at a later stage, you might not be able to see the laser pointer. So I'll try to describe as best I can as I go throughout this part of the presentation. So first of all, you will see quite regularly referred to tank to wake. What the tank to wake is this part of the ship here. It's basically measuring from the fuel tanks on board the vessel to the wake, which is a very small part of the process. When we look at the complete process, which is well to wake, we're effectively going right the way back to this tractor here, right the way through all this production, conversion, transport and distribution, storage, at bunkering, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at the whole supply chain. And there's no point in obviously having low carbon fuels if the tractor being used at the start of this process isn't so uh, decarbonization friendly, let's say. And that's why we have, for example, here, we have renewable energy feeding into this at the top of this uh, chart here, this, this picture. So you can see there's different ways of doing this, but the main thing is we need to be looking at the whole process as opposed to just this one little part of the process, which I'm sure you is, isn't giving a very overall good picture. So that brings us on to the next slide. And basically what this is here is we're looking at the 2023 life cycle analysis guidelines. So the life cycle analysis guidelines Basically, it's MEPC adopted the guidelines on life cycle GHG intensity of marine fuels, LCA guidelines, which set out methods for calculating well to wake and tank to wake GHG emissions for all fuels and other energy carriers, e.g. electricity on board ship. So these guidelines specify sustainability tops topics, aspects for marine fuels and define a fuel life cycle label. The definition of that and the further um, parts of that have not been defined yet. So that's something that will come at later stage. So we're not going to focus on too much about that at this stage, but it's just so that you know a life cycle label may part, form part of the future and collects and conveys relevant information, life cycle assessment and preliminary default emissions factors for various fuels and fuel pathways are provided. But these factors will be further reviewed in the next few years. So we're not going to spend too much detail on the fuel life cycle label aspect of it. What this then leads us to now is the 2023 revised IMO GHD strategy. That's really what's been announced in the last week. All the information that's come forward here, and that's really what we're going to talk about today and home in on a little bit more detail. So at the top here, you can see zero to near zero greenhouse gas emission technology, fuels and energy sources. And what the aim here for is to uptake of above to represent 5% striving 
for 10% of energy used in international shipping by 2030. You will see this term striving used quite a bit throughout the, the terminology in this uh, in this package, and it's something that we've seen more and more coming into it. So there's an ambition for 5%, but striving to 10%. Within that, you have the levels of ambition and indicative checkpoints, which will consider GHG emissions on well-to-wake of marine fuels, as we've discussed on the previous slide there. And what this also leads to and, and contributes to is indicative checkpoints at 2030 and 2040. So let's have a look, you know, when, when we hear that there's not been much of a change here, let's have a look at really what has been announced in the last week and how this compares. Well, if we look at the previous targets here, 2050, the aim was at least 50% reduction by 2050. We can already see that when we look at the proposed targets right of this dotted line here, that in 2030, they're aiming for 20%, striving for 30% reduction of GHG, greenhouse gases. And by 2040, we're looking at 70%, striving for 80%. So we can already see that the targets aimed for in 2040 are way superior than the, the reduction targets aimed for in 2050. So many in the in industry will term the short term targets 2018 to 2023 and then 2030, 2023 and after as medium term and then later on the longer term targets. It's important to remember that there will be an IMO greenhouse gas review on a five yearly basis. That is the planning at this moment in time. And it's also important that to know that carbon intensity of intent international shipping is to reduce CO2 emissions per transport work as an average across international shipping by at least 40% by 2030 compared to 2008 levels. That's a slightly different metric than what we're looking at here, but it's important to keep that figure in your mind in the background. So what are the measures in place to, to look at doing this? So what we've got here is we've got a can, basket of candidate midterm measures and the revised strategy, as we've discussed, states that a basket of candidate measures delivering on the reduction targets should be developed, finalised and comprised of a technical element, which is a goal based marine fuel standard regulating the reduction of GHT intensity of fuels. And on the right hand side here, you'll see what's referred to as an economic element. This is basically some form of a, a, a levy effectively. So the candidate economic elements will be addressed observing specific criteria to be considered within the comprehensive impact assessment report with a view to facilitating the finalization of the basket of member measures. The development of the measures will continue with the IMO and will, according to the agreed timeline, be adopted in 2025 and enter into force in around mid-2027, which sounds like quite a long time away, but the work that's needed to get to these targets really, uh, really you know, stands testament to the work required. Let's now have a quick look at uh, onboard carbon capture. I think we all expected a little bit more progress with carbon capture throughout MEPC80. Um, MEPC80 considered initiating a work process on the application of onboard carbon capture, storage or utilisation, but decided to postpone the, the next intercessional meeting of the working group on GHG reductions. That's expected to take place the week before MEPC 81 in April 2024 and to be linked to the further work on the life cycle analysis guidelines. I'm sure you're all aware there's many complexities in place here, fuel consumption. Aping transfer systems, the quality of the carbon capture, traceability of it, how do you allow for it and how do you measure it throughout the different stages of the process and what sort of carbon benefits that's going to give the ship operator using such a system. So there's lots of complications there and more will become clear as we go through the next stage on that. So what other updates are relevant here? 
So MEPC 80 has also brought in the power reserve with the Shapley EP layer. So that's um, control systems limiting on shaft power or engine power into the EEIX reporting. So uniform EEIX reporting requirements to the administration adopted for such times when power reserve is required. Also at MEPC 80 was the uh, agreed plan to review short term reduction measures for CII, that's Carbon and Intensity Indicator, and EEXI, which is the existing energy efficiency plan. Data gathering, MEPC 82, which is August 2024. So the data is going to be gathered between now and August 2024 for amendments in MEPC 83, which is the summer of 2025. And this may have an impact on CII reduction requirements 2027 to 2030. What else is on the timeline? So we're looking here at MEPC 81, which is spring next year, not too far away. So by then we're expecting an interim report on impact assessment, midterm measures, finalization of baskets of measures, and then finalized report in MEPC 82, autumn 2024. Uh, which is impact assessment of basket of candidate midterm measures, then followed in 2025 by review of short term measures, which would expect to be completed by the 1st of January 2026. So the candidate economic elements will be assessed observing specific criteria to be considered in the comprehensive report, and the midterm GHG reduction measures should effectively promote energy transition. The development of the midterm measures, as we've discussed at the IMO, will hopefully be adopted in 2025, coming into force mid-2027. With that, I'd like to say thank you for your time, and I'm going to hand over to Edwin now. Edwin's going to talk in a little bit more detail about biofuels and DCS and CII. Are you able to take? Great, yeah, thank you. I think I think I've got control. Um, so, control. thank you, Edward. Um, and uh, many of you have probably been wondering about the status of biofuels in DCS and CII, and this is a subject that we spent a little bit of time on uh, at MEPC 80. Um, so we, I'm going to talk a little bit about but, um, the status of biofuels as they are. Um, <clears throat> we agreed a circular, which is we can see the sort of the first page on the slide interim guidance on the use of biofuels under regulations 26 27 28 of mar planning 6 um and this circular will enter into force on the 1st of october 2023 the idea behind these guidelines is that while we have approved um the uh, imo lca guidelines they're not really fully developed so before they're fully developed and linked to cii we need some given that quite a lot of you are already using biofuels. Um, when the, eventually the LCA guidelines are fully developed, this guidance will be rescinded. So this is really a temporary situation uh, for the present time. Now, in order for your biofuel use to be recognized in the DCS and in your CII calculation, you need to meet a couple of requirements. First, it needs to be certified by an international certification scheme, and it has to meet its sustainability criteria. And the, the circular lists two um, or refers to two different certification schemes. Uh, one is ISCC and one is RSB, but it's not just the general ISCC or the general RSB, but it's linked to the ICAO sustainability or CORSIA approved sustainability certification schemes. The second requirement is you must the biofuel must achieve at least a 65% reduction on a well to wick basis relative to fossil MGO. That's so the reference value is 94 grams CO2e per megajoule. So your biofuel in the calculation must be at 33 grams CO2e per megajoule or below. Now, there is still some interpretation that's needed. Uh, with regards to what exactly in the ICAO approved sustainability sustainability certification scheme and the CORSIA sustainability criteria. So 
it's not quite ready to apply yet. Um, so we will have to wait for IX to probably come up with some further guidance as to how this is going to work. Um, so, but the circular is there. We have the bare bones for how um, this ought to be treated. Um, and the way it's going to be done, it will be like this. So the assigned, so we're still going to be using a CF factor in your CII and your DCS reporting. And this value cannot be zero or less than zero. And you calculate it by multiplying the well to wick value of eligible fuels with the lower calorific value. So there's a little an example to the right. If you have waste cooking oil derived uh, fame biofuel and you have a well to wick value of 18 grams CO2 E per megajoule. So that's well below this, the 65% threshold. And the lower calorific value of fame is uh, 0 0.0372 megajoules per gram. So you multiply 18 by the LCV and you get a CF of 0 0.6696. So this is a vast improvement over what you would normally use, uh, which would be 3.206 or 3.114, but it is not zero. So if any of you have been getting zero from your flag state as a temporary measure, that's now going to go away uh, and uh, it you, you get a, your CA will have to use. Blends should be based on a uh, CF of the different fuels uh, by energy. In effect, actually, you'd probably calculate it by mass, but um, this was a bit of a last minute drafting and we we may need to be a bit clearer on this. Um, proof of sustainability should then be provided with the BDN for verification purposes. If you have a biofuel that does not meet the sustainability criteria or the well to wick threshold, so let's say the improvement is 60%, not 65%, then that fuel will be assigned a CF of the equivalent fossil fuel type, i.e. it will not be recognized at all. Um, so this, so some of you might be a little bit disappointed because it's not zero, uh, but at least there are now um, criteria and a level playing field for how we're going to deal with this. Um, you probably start asking your, um, um, your RO, your uh, classification society as to how they're going to treat this. Um, you may get slightly different answers for now, and you may ask your fuel supplier as well. There's going to be a little bit of time, I think, where uh, between the fuel suppliers and the class societies, they'll need to figure out how to implement this in practice. So we await further guidance, um, but at least there is there will eventually be some recognition of biofuels. Um, OK. Now, I mentioned LCA guidelines. Um, they were approved, uh, and as I alluded to, they're not fully developed yet. So here's the contents page of the draft LCA guidelines. Um, and as with most things at the IMO, when, you, when they're not quite complete, we have an intersessional correspondence group to do some further work. And this has been indeed been established to further develop the guidelines. So the main tasks of the correspondence group will be to review the template for well to tank data collection and also to develop a template for tank to weight default emission factors in order to collect more default values for the fuels and pathways in the guidelines. We have quite a lot of fuels in the guidelines, but most of them don't have a default value associated with them. And so um, the idea is that we need to populate the LC guidelines further um, with with default values before it can be kind of usable as a, as a general document. And then we need to connect it with some measures. Um, some of the terms used in the equation, so Mark alluded to the whole carbon capture issue. So some of the terms in the well to tank, as you can see up on the screen, um, including uh, carbon capture during fuel production and as well as onboard carbon capture and storage will need to be further considered because we had no time in the last year to fully develop the kind of the understanding and the consideration of how we would treat carbon capture and what the requirements would be through the chain. So if you had to store it, if um, how we would treat that and what the requirements and storage would be, if you're going to reuse the carbon somewhere, what's the process for crediting that and how we're going to track that through all the multiple reuse scenarios. We also need to, we need to consider how we're going to treat shore power 
uh, and this is now uh, and it will be an issue, of course, worldwide within the EU. Of course, we have few EU which mandate shore power and treats it as zero, but we may not come to the same conclusion necessarily in uh, for a worldwide. So this is something that still needs to be decided. And you will, of course, be aware um, with what we just talked about on the biofuels, um, the IMO doesn't have any certification and verification processes for fuels. Uh, and this needs to be developed at least for fuels, at least on a well to wake basis and any sustainability criteria that all needs to be developed. So that work uh, will also be done and there'll be a review which the IMO secretary will conduct and this will report to an expert workshop prior to MEPC 81. So there's progress, but we're not quite there yet. And there's probably quite a lot. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of details that need to be examined uh, before we have a, a fully functioning um, LCA guidelines. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is that we agreed some cha changes to DCS reporting. Um, so today you report total uh, fuel consumption of different fuel types. You don't um, you don't separate this uh, in in any way. Um, we um, approve these draft amendments, and these will be uh, adopted at MEPC 81 in spring 2024, and but potential entry into force towards the end of 2025 to be active for data collected in 2026, which will be submitted in 2027. So as with all IMO processes, there's a bit of a lag time. Regulation takes time to sort of catch up, if you like. Um, what are the main differences? The main differences are we're now going to be required to report fuel consumption per combustion system. So main engine fuel consumption will be separate from your generator fuel consumption, will be separate from separated from your uh, boiler fuel consumption. And if you're an LNG carrier, for example, um, if you have uh, if you've burnt some LNG in your gas combustion unit uh, or you've done some steam dumping, this will need to be also reported separately from everything. The idea behind this, of course, is that um, you then we might then be able to change CII to something which is more focused on uh, propulsion uh, and we can take out all the generator and boiler and other consumption that at the moment um, sort of makes CII sometimes very difficult to comply with. There's a request for fuel consumption uh, when the ship is not underway. So at least we also separate that by um, by operational phase. Um, there is a need to um, there will be a need to report laden distance, although this is sort of vol voluntary. The reason for this is because laden distance is linked to one of the voluntary indicators called EEPI. EEPI being something like AER, but the distance traveled in the denominator is only laden distance. Um, the, the the next couple of sort of major things here will be we will be required to report total transport work in ton miles. So this is a kind of EOI like uh, measure, but also because the, the IMO is assessing uh, how the shipping industry's uh, efficiency is improved on over two metrics. So one is what we call a supply based metric, which is kind of AER, and the other one is a demand based metric, uh, which is uh, which is EOI. So effectively ton miles, but this is aggregated ton miles. So those of you who are concerned about confidentiality, you're not reporting at least to the IMO per voyage, how much cargo you carried on that voyage. It's the total aggregated one, and you can't work backwards from that aggregated figure to work out how much cargo you've actually carried through the year and what distance. So it, it, we, this do reporting total transport work is a way of preserving confidentiality. Now, for most ships, you only report ton miles, cargo ton miles, uh, for container ships, additionally, you will report TEU miles because that's the unit that you use most often. And for passenger ships, i.e. ferries and crews, there is also a need to, rec to record um, passenger miles. There is some work that will be needed to, re um, to amend the SEMP guidelines to define some of these terms and to describe how few consumption from auxiliaries and boilers and um, gas combustion units uh, may be collected. So that work will be ongoing now. The final thing you need to uh, then report additionally is uh, whether any innovative technology as defined in the IMO cir um, circular 896, if you, any of this has been installed. Um, right, I think 
that's the end of my slides. So handing over to is it Eva or Helen? Eva, Eva, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Edwin, uh, and thank you, Mark, for this uh, high level analysis. We will now turn to more basic but still important uh, stuff. Uh, my name is Eva Kelesidou. I am a claims handler based in Greece. I focus on environmental issues and I am a part of uh, the club's pollution and decarbonization expertise teams. Uh, I will talk uh, very briefly about a proposal that was made for a unified interpretation to clarify that banker delivery notes are acceptable either in hard copy or electronic format, provided they meet the requirements of the MARPOL regulations. The proposal states that there are possible, there is possible protection from modification and it is possible authentication through uh, verified uh, methods. I think I have control. Yes. Now, Mark. So what is the current status? Uh, Sorry, excuse me for that. I am now, I think, on the correct slide. So, uh, regulation 18.5 of MARPOL requires the BDN to record details of the fuel oil or gas for combustion purposes delivered uh, to the ship uh, and uh, for use on board. Uh, it also requires the BDN to contain at least the minimum information as specified in Appendix 5 of MARPOL Annex 6. This is relevant to the quantity, for example, density, sulfur content and other. Uh, at this point, I would like to mention that uh, during MEPC 79, it was agreed that the BDN should also include information about the measured flash point to ensure the safety of the ships. And this will come into force as of 1st of May 2024. What we also know is that regulation 18.6 of MARPOL requires the BDN to be readily available on board for port state control inspection and should be retained no less than three years from delivery. Usually uh, the BDN will serve also as a proof of the quantity delivered to the vessel. It would be uh, signed by the chief engineer or the master and uh, retained, uh, the original will be retained on board uh, for further inspection. Currently, there is no stipulation within MARPOL uh, on the specific form that the banker delivery node should have, whether this should be physical or it should be electronic. Uh, and um, where there have been uh, electronically produced uh, banger delivery nodes, uh, there have been some challenges. The proposal has put forward uh, some advantages uh, in terms of the issuance of the electronic version of the banger delivery nodes. Uh, it was uh, highlighted that there will be transparency and transferability of the information. There would be a central database uh, where the information would be stored and would be accessed by the authorized people for further analysis in the context of the environmental uh, regulations. Uh, it will be serve as a backup in case the original uh, banger delivery node on board the vessel would be lost. We will reduce uh, the paperwork and the admin burden, and there would be uh, the, the scenarios of tampering the information would be uh, eliminated. What are the associated challenges with that? Is that uh, there may be different digital platforms uh, used by the ships, and therefore there may be some compatibility issues. Uh, we, there may be connectivity issues uh, that 
could affect uh, access uh, to the electronic version of the banger delivery node when needed. Uh, legal issues of acceptance, uh, the electronic signatures. We don't know uh, worldwide the various jurisdictions, uh, what approach will adopt on that. Uh, currently, the banger delivery node requires signature by both ends, so this may be an issue. And it's unclear whether the, whether the banks will accept the electronic version of the banger delivery note with electronic signatures, although this uh, will likely be an issue for the banker sub supplier uh, itself rather than the owner uh, or the charterer. The banker supplier is required to deposit uh, the banker delivery note to the bank so that the payment is released. The payment made by the owner or the charterer about the fuel quantity is released to him. So it would be recommended that prior approval and consent by the bank is obtained. Now, some practical solutions that have been suggested is that perhaps the electronic version of the banker delivery node can be generated on a central portal and thereafter can be printed uh, and signed by both parties and thereafter uploaded again on the system for further use. Otherwise, they say that perhaps the same approach should be adopted as we have currently with electronic statutory SIPs or CFRS certificates, whereby those are issued from the flag administration. Uh, they are electronically signed from that end, and there is no need for the master or the chief engineer to also insert uh, an electronic signature. So during MEPC 80, uh, that proposal was uh, accepted and it was agreed uh, that there would be a unified interpretation confirming that the banker delivery nodes are acceptable in either physical or electronic format provided the necessary requirements under MARPOL Annex 6 are met. Uh, the electronic uh, banker delivery node will be protected from any edits, modifications or revisions. And there would be an a possible authentication by verification method that can be either a QR code or some GPS coordinates, a watermark, a tracking number, uh, many proposals to that end. Uh, the unified interpretation uh, will be included in one of the future uh, circulars of MEPC. So uh, this takes me to the next slide uh, where I would like to highlight the importance of having accurate information within the banker delivery node, whether this is in hard copy or an electronic version, um, it plays an important role. When we are handling uh, claims uh, which involve bankers and uh, there is some incorrect information, we know we are going to face some challenges whilst handling that. However, now more than ever, uh, the parties are recommended to exercise due diligence and make sure that the correct information is inserted on the banker delivery note, regardless of of its form because this will uh, form part of the evidence submitted for the IMO um, data collection system and the EU uh, MRV. Now, any correct information may have uh, implications on the SIPs emissions measurements and the SIPs rating uh, in view of CII and EU ETS. This will, will likely result also in a commercial complications too. So be aware um, and make sure that uh, any uh, necessary corrections are addressed well in advance. Uh, do inform the relevant uh, flag state ad administration and uh, send copies of any such information to the banker uh, 
port authorities uh, and uh, supplier. And needless to say that you should uh, have the club involved at an early stage uh, to help you uh, if needed. And um, lastly, this would be, uh, I think, um, a nice opportunity for you to consider once again the contractual arrangements in place to ensure that the fuel oil supply process uh, is to be in accordance with the requir requirements of MARPOL. And for more uh, contractual digging, uh, I will hand over to my colleague uh, Helen. And Helen, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Eva. And good day to everyone on the webinar. Um, for those of you who are new to the Navigating Decarbonisation webinars or who haven't come across me, um, I'm a solicitor in the FD&D team. And so as well as being on North's Navigating Decarbonisation Expertise Group, um, I'm also on the BIMCO Drafting Committee for Carbon Clauses. So I've been helping a number of members with inquiries on the contractual side of the decarbonisation regulations. So now that you've had um, a very helpful update from Mark, Edwin and Eva on what was discussed and decided upon at MEPC80, I'm going to move on to the contractual implications and what you need to consider um, or may need to consider from a contractual angle. Um, also, given that we've all had a number of questions in from members in relation to the EU ETS, um, while that's not directly related to MEPC 80, I'll also just briefly turn to that at the end as well. So starting with the first of my topics, um, which is biofuels and charter party aspects to consider. Um, as has been mentioned, if certain criteria are met, then biofuels may be assigned a different carbon factor to the equivalent fossil fuel. And the implications of this is that it will be preferable for the purpose of CII calculations. So in recent years, and certainly prior to MEPC 80, there's been a lot more interest in the use of biofuels as a way of reducing emissions. However, given these latest developments at MEPC 80, um, it's expected that the interest in biofuels is going to increase further. From a charter party perspective, um, as you'd expect, if you're using biofuels or considering using biofuels, then consideration needs to be given to the bunker clauses in the charter party. And all of the clauses dealing with bunkers and fuel in the charter party are going to need to be reviewed. Um, the clause dealing with bunker specification needs careful consideration. There's a concern that with the um, increased production of biofuels that there may be or may start to be more um, quality issues with poorer quality biofuels coming onto the market. There's no standard specification for biofuels either. So ISO 8217 is a fossil fuel standard and it can certainly be used in terms of um, a specification clause, but there are other parameters to consider as well. So, for example, um, in relation to the FAME content, um, the FAME content pursuant to ISO specification is different to that normally encountered in biofuels. So in a charter party clause addressing um, the biofuel specification, the specific FAME content requirement could be included. In addition, because of um, the FAME content, just from a sort of management perspective, um, it makes it harder to separate water and in turn microbes. So careful handling and good housekeeping on board is really important um, with biofuels. Um, back to the charter parties, um, it's also worth considering um, certainly from an owner's perspective to have some catch-all wording in a um, bunker specification clause or biofuel specification clause that it shall be stable um, and homogenous and suitable for burning in the vessel's engines. Uh, in addition, wording can be included that the charterers are to provide biofuels of a quality and specification that are approved by the engine manufacturer. Um, and evidence of this can be a no objection letter from the engine manufacturer. 
a requirement could also be included in the charter party for charterers to provide a certificate of quality as well. Um, the performance warranty should also be reviewed and if necessary amended. And that's because biofuels use a bit more fuel than fossil fuels for the same propulsion, um, so that may need to be addressed. Potential inclusion of a tank cleaning clause and review of clauses dealing with maintenance um, and dry docking might also be necessary. Cleaning tanks from previous fuels prior to bunkering biofuels may, be, uh, may well be prudent. Um, and also if there are quality concerns, if a clean tank has been used from the outset, um, then it makes any potential disputes possibly easier to deal with. Um, consideration of whether alternative fuels may need to be provided in the event of non-availability of the, the agreed biofuel, um, and, and if so, then how that should be provided for in the charter party. There's obviously a concern that um, with the increased in demand for biofuels, there may be instances of non-availability. So those are just some of the points to um, con consider from a charter party perspective when looking at uh, using biofuels. So I'm now going to turn to um, another option for reducing emissions in the form of carbon capture and storage systems. Um, the work on this and whether and how to include carbon capture and storage systems in the IMO's regulatory framework has been pushed back, as Edwin has said. However, given that it remains under review and we know that members have already started installing these systems and there are other members who are interested in looking at this as an option, I thought I'd still highlight a couple of points to bear in mind from the Charter Party perspective. So provision um, may need to be included in the Charter Party in relation to the time and cost of installation of the carbon capture and storage system if that's to be undertaken during the period when the vessel will be on charter. Um, it may be that there are consequential implications in relation to the dry docking clause and that and that might also need to be looked at. Um, description clauses will need to be reviewed as well as performance warranties. And this is because it might be that the carbon capture and storage system increases the fuel consumption or requires a greater uh, power generation capacity. As the carbon capture and storage system will form part of the ship's machinery and equipment, if there is a breakdown, um, then it's likely, and in the absence of there being any other provision to the country in the charter party, that time lost a, as a result of that breakdown will cause the vessel to be off hire under a standard off hire clause in a time charter party. Um, owners and charters are also going to want to know whether the CO2 storage tanks can be discharged at the same time as cargo operations happening. Um, and if not, then charters may want express provision dealing with this. Finally, um, it's also worth considering the vessel's trading pattern um, to ensure that the needed port infrastructure to discharge and transport the captured CO2 will be available. So moving on to midterm measures. Um, and as you've heard um, already during this webinar, the basket of midterm measures haven't yet been decided. What we do know is that MEPC at, at MEPC 81 um, in spring next year, an interim report will be put forward with a view to finalising the basket of midterm measures. And there's to be a final report at MEPC 82 in autumn next year. Um, with the approval of the measures being left to MEPC 83 in spring 2025. However, what's important from a charter party perspective is that these measures are to be adopted in autumn 2025 and enter into force in uh, 2027. So to the extent that these measures could have charter party implications, if you're entering into or when you start entering into um, charter parties that are going to span into 2027 and beyond, then that's when you're going to be interested in the detail of um, these midterm measures so that provision can be provided in the charter parties if that's necessary. It's obviously really hard to draft for the unknown 
um, which is what anybody would be doing if we started drafting clauses at the moment um, to address these potential future midterm measures uh, where we don't know the detail or the identity of them. Um, but if you do have charter parties that are going to span into 2027, then you may want to provide for some wording to try to protect your position in the event, for example, there is a global levy um, on emissions and there is a wish for that to be passed down or shared between the parties. Um, as has already been mentioned, um, what we know is that there will be an economic measure and I think there are a number of proposals on the table such as a greenhouse gas levy or global emission pricing mechanism and there'll also be the technical measure in the form of a global green fuel standard. In terms of the greenhouse gas levy or something along those lines, if there is to be a contribution um, by ships per tonne of CO2 or greenhouse gas emitted and this rests in the first instance with the ship or the owners um, or like with the EU ETS, the DOC hold under the ISM code, then it's going to rest with owners in the first instance. Um, and it might be recognised that the entity that is responsible for the speed and route of the ship or for the fuel might be the correct entity to be responsible for that cost or levy. Um, or it might be that it, it um, there's a, a will for it to be shared between the parties. And either way, um, to pass part or all of it um, down the chain or between the parties uh, is likely to need an express term in the charter party. Um, moving on to another area where provision in a charter party context has also been rather challenging um, and in this case despite the regulations being in force and um, onto the CII. So in previous webinars we've gone into quite a bit of detail on the CII um, and the contractual implications including the review um, of the BIMCO CII operations clause for time charter parties. So I don't intend to repeat um, content from previous webinars um, but we are now six months into the CII and you might be interested to know what types of questions, clauses and issues um, we've seen come across our desks in the first half of 2023 in respect of CII. We've received and reviewed a number of different CII clauses. It certainly remains the case that the majority of these CII clauses, I would say, are more charter friendly. Um, and some of which are not really more than charterers agreeing to cooperate with owners, um, but also they tend to be subject to charterers' commercial interests. That said, as the months have gone on, we have started to see some more owners that have become more concerned about the rating of their ship um, and what it will achieve next year based on this year's emissions reporting. That concern seems to be predominantly driven by commercial concerns rather than because of the regulations themselves. Um, at present, the regulations don't really have any bite when it comes to enforcement, um, but we have started seeing press reports regarding vessel prices being affected by lower CII ratings and heard of certain charterers saying that they won't um, charter in ships of lower, um, lower ratings. So it seems that CII rating of a ship is going to be a more important factor in chartering terms um, because charterers can use it to determine the competitiveness of a ship um, and its ability to trade over the longer term. So it might be that as the months continue on and we go into and through 2024, that owners start trying to be a bit firmer when it comes to the charter party clauses um, in, in their contracts, but we will have to wait and see. Um, just in terms of CII generally, I think what has been made clear um, in these six months is how important the data is. Um, and that's not only for the owners, but also for the charterers when they're um, determining the, the implications of their orders in relation to the ship. Um, obviously, CII remains in for quite a lot of criticism but it does appear to be here to stay at least for a few years. Um, the review by 2026 will include a review of the metric as well as the correction factors, uh, including for short voyages and put waiting time, um, which we know is obviously a concern for a number of um, members. 
Now, quickly before, so we still have hopefully some time for questions. I'll just touch upon the EU ETS. Um, I'm sure you'll have seen that the EU ETS has been finally adopted. Um, while we had been getting many inquiries from members prior to the legislation being finalised, of course, now with the legislation being finalised, we've been getting a number of other inquiries and some inquiries that are quite specific. And that's not surprising when there were reports in the press about um, the EU ETS costing the shipping industry three billion um, in 2024 and going up to 10 billion uh, US dollars um, a year once fully implemented from 2026. So just in brief, um, shipping will be included in the EU ETS from the 1st of January 2024, and there will be a phased in approach with allowances for 40% of emissions to be purchased and surrendered for 2024 emissions, going up to 70% in 2025 and 100% from 2026 onwards. It applies to vessels of 5,000 GT um, and above, and on 100% of voyages between EU ports and 50% um, of the, the voyages between EU and non-EU countries. For 2024 and 2025, it'll just catch CO2 emissions, but from 2026 will include methane and nitrous oxide as well. The deadline for surrendering emissions will fall on the 30th of September the following year. So for 2024 allowances for reported uh, verified emissions, they'll need to be surrendered by the 30th of September 2025 at the latest. Um, as we know, the legislation sits with the shipping company, um, which is the DOC holder under the ISM code. But there is provision in the legislation for member states to take necessary measures to um, pass the responsibility on to um, the entity who has responsibility for purchase or operation of the ship or both. Um, however, what those necessary measures may be um, will depend on each individual member state and what they implement, um, and we don't have that information currently. So it would be preferable to include express provision in your charter parties, um, depending on how you want to deal with the EU ETS. An example of that um, kind of charter party clause is the BIMCO Emission Trading Scheme Allowances Clause for Time Charter Parties. And I should also say that there is work being done by the BIMCO Drafting Committee to produce an Emission Trading Scheme Allowances Clause for voyage charters as well. Um, and finally, I will just mention that the UK have now agreed to bring domestic shipping into the UK emission trading system from 2026, um, albeit the detail of that is currently unknown. Um, and I think I've spoken beyond my allotted time, so um, I will pass back to Mark for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen, Edwin, Eva. Very much appreciated all good presentations. Um, Cesar, um, have your hand up at the moment. I don't know whether you want to type in the chat or we can try allowing your microphone. Um, but if you're able to type into the chat, please. Um, if not, I can try um, enabling your microphone. Um, but I, I see you had a hand. There was a hand raised, but I don't know if Cesar's still there at the moment. So I'm just going to try bringing Cesar online now. So. OK, anyway, they're, they're, they're not there anymore. I don't know whether the connection's lost or, or what's happened there. Is there any other questions for the chat at the moment? W while we're waiting for the for that question to come, um, these are the email addresses, all the contact from anybody that you spoke today. So please feel free to reach out with us with any questions. Um, I think we've got something popping into the chat now. Yeah, OK, so let's have a look at this question. So keep in mind. Um, Yeah, I think this is just more for information. I think it's not actually a question by the by the looks of it, from what I can gather. To keep in mind that marine engines must carry out some modifications in order to use biofuels safely and max 30% of biofuel mix. Yeah, that's in line with the unified interpretation. Um, and thank you for bringing that point forward 
Umberto de Marta. That's a good point. Uh, excellent, thank you. Um, so yeah, so we're going to now take the presentation down just in case we've got any more questions um, out there. Um, so that should leave us with an open screen. If Edwin, Eva, if you could put your cameras on as well, please. Um, I'm just going to go with an, another question that we've had in the registration process. If there's any more questions, please type them into the chat. Um, one of the questions we had during the registration process was biofuels availability. Now, I'm sure everybody in the virtual room now with me will agree that biofuel availability is not the best at the moment. There's other industries fighting for its use as well. So um, from the feedback we've seen throughout the industry, it's not um, and the availability is not as good as we would have hoped uh, for for many ship owners because in some cases it's a drop in solution and um, so it's not that great. Um, another question that we have is which fuel is the best one and we would all love to have a crystal ball and just give you one similar answer um, but unfortunately it really is um, horses for courses and different fuel types to so different vessel types different trading patterns depending on your range and and anything else that's there. Um, we've had some other questions. Helen, we've got a question coming on in the BIMCO now, so I'm going to bounce that one in your direction if that's okay. Thanks, Mark, um, and thanks, Lars. In relation to the um, BIMCO CII clause, the question should be that should it be updated to include any future cost the CII to be for charterers account, similar to the ETS clause. Well, I think in, in relation to the way it's currently drafted, there is obviously the right for the owners to bring a claim against charterers if there is a breach of the clause. So that's the way in which um, the intention behind the clause is really that, that there would be a there would be a claim by um, by the owners to try and um, recover any losses that they suffer as a result of um, charterers breach of their obligations under that clause. Um, I think we've got another biofuels yeah. question. Yeah, I mean, uh, Edwin may want to chip in on this, but I, I believe there's work going on in the ISO working group with respect to biofuel standards, but it, my understanding is that that's not ready at this moment in time, and it's probably going to be some time before it is ready. I don't know if you know any different, Edwin, but I believe that um, it's not quite there yet, basically, um, and it's going to take some time. I think there was so a PAS. There was a PAS that were working. They were working on. Um, I yeah. need to check on the status of that. Yeah, yeah, but it's. Uh, I, I know it's not that far through the process, but I know it's a work in progress. That that's. That's I know there was work going on in the background, but that hopefully answers that question. Helen, I'm going to bounce this one back to you again. Sorry about um, from Rajiv Turturab on the EU ETS. Yeah. Um, so question in relation to who will eventually pay the EU ETS owners or charterers or managers? Uh, will it be the usual negotiating powers of the parties? Um, well, the commercial bargaining power of the parties will always have a role to play. Um, I suppose the other the other kind of recognised element is what is accepted in the industry as well. Um, we have seen the um, BIMCO ETSA clause go into a number of charter parties, so there obviously is um, quite a lot of industry acceptance in terms of passing the liability down to um, down to charterers in relation to um, the cost of the allowances. I think there is obviously from the just to touch upon the, the kind of managers point, there obviously is a concern from managers who ultimately have that responsibility for surrendering um, the allowances and ensuring that they um, the management contracts are dealt with properly. Um, and that it's provided for effectively in the management contracts. Uh, so I, I think from from the manager's side that needs to be looked at. But I think there is obviously an, an, a general intention that it will probably get passed down the chain. Um, and like I mentioned, under the legislation itself, the member states are supposed to be introducing these necessary measures um, to allow for 
um, recovery of allowance costs um, where there's a contractual arrangement between the party responsible um, and the entity responsible for the operation of the ship. We're just not sure exactly what that will look like, um, which is why I think it's better to make express provision in the charter parties themselves. Thank you, Helen. Um, just the next question now, there will surely be a cost for the CI itself, like ETS. Uh, I mean, obviously we know there will be costs for that, but it will increase the marketability of your vessel, obviously, and you know, it's something that the cost is something that's out there, but obviously I'm sure Helen will back me up on this, that obviously it's going to make you a lot more lucrative to charters out there. So yeah, there is an initial cost, but obviously better CII ratings are attracting um, more charters from what we're seeing, even at these earlier stages. Um, the next question is on fuel oil analysis, and I may bounce this one in Edwin's direction, but from my understanding is there needs to be a lot more defined, correct um, carbon factor values because it's going to start every, costing everybody money. So there needs to be some sort of clarity from suppliers on this. I don't know what Edwin's thoughts on that are. And while Edwin's answering that question, I also, I think there's a question, the next question on corrective factors is possibly something you've been dealing with at the IMO as well, Edwin. So I'm going to bounce both those questions in your direction, if that's okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, so bunker suppliers will have to supply ICC certification as an example. And in that ICC certification, they'll need to show the well to weight calculation and the well to weight value of that fuel. Um, sorry, well, well to tank. And um, so this, you will have to check it. Uh, you, you'll have to look at the look at what's being um, delivered and you probably have to check it because in the initial period, I think there will be lots of different types of fuels and lots of different types of feedstocks. Um, and there'll probably be no shortage of confusion. Um, so you, you will need to look at this. So even if it is certified, I, I mean, buyer beware as all, in, in all cases. Um, will they be forced to supply the well? They won't. They won't supply the carbon factor exactly because now, on the biofuel side, we're saying we want we want the well to weight value, not the carbon factor. But the carbon factor is derived from the well to weight value, uh, as well as the LCV. So this is um, at least how it's envisioned for the moment. Um, regarding correction factors, we uh, at the IMO we're not envisioning any approval of any further correction factors before. Uh, before the review. The idea of the review is to take the whole thing very holistically and then consider how we need to deal with this. So in the short term, I wouldn't expect there to be any additional correction factors also because um, if we approve correction factors, we then need to update the SEMP and that needs to go through an entire another approval process for which there's a kind of effectively a lag time um, of whatever it is a year. So and as I said in the DCS in the DCS remarks, the the whole idea of actually moving to separating propulsion from non-propulsion fuel consumption is that you can ultimately have a propulsion only CII and a propulsion only CII, which doesn't have the influence of generators, then the whole waiting time problem actually goes away. Uh, so that's the some of the kind of forward thinking as to where we think we're going to end up. Hope that helps. Thank you. Thanks, Edwin. And I think Helen, this will be the final question because we're now five minutes over. So I'm going to bounce this final question in your direction on the BIMCO clause. Um, if you need any backup on the overconsumption side of it, please give me a share. Uh, and we have one more question that's came in as well after that. We'll, we'll have to close the questions off after that. One. Thank you. Um, yes, sorry. So how does owner account for the overconsumption quantities resulting from technical uh, technical perspective in terms of EUTS, how would that be reimbursed? Is such a provision considered in the BIMCO clause? So I think the um, what that's getting at is in terms of if there is an overconsumption under the performance warranties, probably, um, and therefore because of that, the charterers are then having to buy increased number of allowances to pass to owners. Um, my view is that this is probably something that's going to come um, as an additional claim in relation to performance warranties. So charterers' losses will effectively include that as a um, 
as a further loss when when it comes to overconsumption. Thank you. And Edwin, is it the last question something you've got more working knowledge on based on your recent IMO meetings? Not entirely clear uh, what Nicole's question is, and we may need to continue this conversation offline, but um, the yeah. proof of sustainability is this how we drafted it. But effectively, that will be the, the actual ISCC certificate uh, or uh, the from the other uh, the other scheme uh, where the all the the values are calculated or laid out and it indicates where it's come from so there's some providence and and so on um it's drafted vaguely uh at the moment just because we didn't have a lot of time for drafting effectively so what what will finally be the required proof uh, may also vary in some cases um yeah okay thank you and i, I think the last one is more of a statement to consider really edwin and perhaps one for you to just take note of that the industry needs to consider a vessel stay in a yard conversion like three months and more CIA rating. Um, but that would be class of waiting time effectively from a correction factor perspective. Well, not even waiting time. It's it shouldn't be counted towards the CIA rating, in my understanding. You get stuck on something like this, talk to your flag state and your and the class society. Um, because there are always these exceptional circumstances and you, you you may be able to find some some way to deal with some, some stuff like this. I mean, <clears throat> the long term view is that we will eventually need to deal with all of this, but properly, as I said, it's kind of separating the consumption uh, in the short term. There's going to be some pain. Um, the other thing I heard earlier, there was some talk about uh, reduced values, uh, secondhand values because of CII. You need to probably say to the charters and the market that CII is historical. Um, and so what you did last year may not be what the vessel does this year or next year. And really, they need to look at EDI and EXI, and not just on the CII rating. So EDI and EXI is effectively the potential, and CII is tied up with operations. And if you've got lots of waiting time or all kinds of other stuff, your CII will look very bad. Um, but that's not necessarily the, truth, the whole story. Thank you. That's excellent. All right. Well, I think we've run over by about eight minutes there. Um, thank you very much. For, um, for the presenters, Eva, Helen, Edwin. Thank you very much for all our members, brokers, and anybody else who joined this call, who showed interest, who sent us questions. We will be sending a follow-up package to anybody who's registered, which includes a recording, some of the questions, and, and a copy of the slides as well. And please, like I say, please feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any questions. We're more than happy to help. And, Thank you very much, all of you, for your time. We know it's a very busy day for you all, so thanks again and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.